A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again that we are yours and you are ours. We thank you that your work that you have done through your son, Jesus, is complete. There's nothing we need to add to it. And when he cried out, it is finished, the work was finished, and we praise you that he's now at your right hand praying for us. Lord, he doesn't get tired of us. He doesn't get tired praying for us, and we thank you for that. And we pray that we would have such endurance, too, in our life. Send your spirit, we ask, Lord, to teach us your word. Without your spirit, we are ignorant. We don't want to be that way. We want to know your word better, to glorify you, to enjoy you, to help each other, and to be a light to this world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we are finishing up. That's the plan to finish up the course today on church government. And um, we talked to uh, some additional thoughts on the doctrine of the church. Uh, we talked about uh, the church is one people of God, um, right? There's one people of God in the Old Testament, the New Testament. That was meant to be a not so subtle disagreement with dispensationalism. Okay, dispensationalism has two people of God, or peoples of God. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the church visible and invisible. And we saw how that concept actually is in scripture when, when Paul in Romans says, not all Israel is of Israel. So we saw that in uh, Romans 2 and uh, Romans 9. Um, and now at the bottom of page 12, and let me see, Connor and Katie, do you have page 12? Here you go. And Katie, could you, anybody else need a page 12 and 13? Huh? Thank you, Katie. So, um, so the, 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 I want to deal with the issue quickly on church membership. And the reason simply is because this is such an attack concept um, uh, in, among fundamentalists mm -hmm. and, uh, people today. I, I hesitate to use the word, do you need one of these, huh? Yeah. There you go. Uh, I, had, I hesitate to use the term evangelical. Uh, the term evangelical used to be used, as, uh, um, it was coined in the late 1940s. Um, it, you know, well, no, even before then, the neo-evangelical term was coined then. Um, to mean those who believed the Bible and were serious about the gospel, the word evangelical is the Greek word euangelos, which just simply means good news, the word gospel. And um, however that, the people who call themselves evangelical, they have so evolved in their beliefs that um, a, be a much better term for them is heretics, and I mean that intentionally, uh, denying things like sufficiency of scripture and, and substitutionary death of Christ and those kinds of basics, you know, really denying the basics. Uh, some people who call themselves evangelical still are solid Bible-believing people, but not all. But anyway, these people deny the, the issue of church membership uh, many groups today brag that they don't have members. Calvary Chapel is one of them. They, who, they don't have members, and they think the concept of membership is unbiblical because they say, show me one verse where it says you have to be a member of the church. Um, I want to disagree with that whole approach. Okay? Show me one verse that says God is triune. There are none. Okay? There are none. Um, but we believe in the Trinity because we look, at, we look at data and then we summarize the data and we come up with a statement that lo and behold looks like the doctrine of the Trinity. Well, we're going to look at some data and see the concept of church membership seems to be something that's assumed uh, in the New Testament as we look at that. So let's begin uh, with the Great Commission. So where is the Great Commission in the Bible? Notice at the bottom of page 12 there's no reference, but where is it? Matthew 28. Very good. Um, the next Saint School class apparently is going to be on the Great Commission and its implications for us. Okay. So right at the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 16, then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, and some, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
And I'm sure you've heard many sermons on this and they have told you quite correctly that the word go there is a mistranslation. It's not an imperative in the Greek, it's a, it's a participle. So it really should be translated having gone. Um, the, and the imperative then is make disciples. So having gone therefore make disciples and then it has two uh, other participles that are what we call epexegetical. That simply means they explain what you do. So you make disciples by doing two things. What are they? Baptizing them and teaching them. Okay? So that's how you make disciples. And the baptism there, I think, is a reference to the initiatory rite coming into the church. In other words, preach the gospel to these people and then you, start, and then you teach them God's word. Okay? Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, the question that we have to ask is, to whom is this imperative? Make disciples, that's the imperative. To whom is this imperative given? Okay, look at the text. What does it say? To the 11. Exactly. Who are the 11? The apostles, right? Now, my question to you then is, that means that, does that mean when the last apostle died, this command is therefore irrelevant? Or does that mean those 11 are really our representatives and the leaders of the church? I think the latter is what is there. Okay. So to the, to the church is given the command to make disciples. Now that's important. There's all kinds of controversy. It's been going on for at least 50 or 60 years between what is and what is not a proper um, para-church organization. The proper term is a para-ecclesiastical organization. Para means along the side of, like paraclete, parakletos, you know, someone called alongside of to help. So, um, in a lot of those organizations, they say, well, we do what we do. You know, Camp Crusade, Navigators, those are the college age ones. There's lots of other ones that are quite good. Those that are proper will say, we, here, we are here to help the church. And they do things to help the church. And they realize they're really servants of the church. And some of them are really quite good. But my point here is the command is given to the leaders of the church. Let's go on. Um, many commands in the New Testament assume New Test uh, church membership. Here's the second point. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 2. You, you may need to write these references down. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12. <clears throat> uh, 12 to 13. I think I have the wrong reference. Is it Second Thessalonians? No, that's the wrong reference. I'm sorry. First, I have First Thessalonians two twelve to thirteen, but uh, that you should walk worthy of the God who has called you into His own kingdom and glory. And for this reason, we also thank God. Let's see. You know, that's the wrong reference. I'll get the right one for you. I apologize. But uh, Colossians 3, okay. that's one of the many one another passages. Uh, Colossians 3, 16. Okay. Who's the one another? Okay. Um, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God through him. Who's the one another? That's the question I want to ask you. Yeah, it's us, right? It's each other. It's us in the church. Okay. Okay. Uh, turn, turning over. Uh, teaching about discipleship assumes um, church membership. Uh, what's Matthew 18? Everybody talks about Matthew 18. It's the passage on church discipline, among other things. It's Matthew 18, verse 17. So when Jesus says there, you go to somebody and you talk to them, 18, okay. Uh, if your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take, 
with you one or two more uh, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to hear the church, let, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Now, the, I submit to you that one of the big problems with the church today is that we, the word church today means plural for Christian. Okay? But the word church in scripture is not plural for Christian. It has other nuances like organization. Uh, this whole course has been about offices in the church, elders, things like that. So uh, the big discussion in theology is the church an organization or an organism? The answer is both, okay? So when you tell it to the church and you put somebody outside of the church that assumes they were in the church, you can't put somebody out of the church unless they were first in the church. And that assumes organization and membership and those kinds of things. Um, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper assumes church membership. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, the, the whole issue of how uh, we are to do the Lord's Supper, and we do it very carefully here. That's one of the great things here. Um, but in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, beginning in verse 17, okay. uh, now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. But first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of them. Looks like they were having dinner when they had the Lord's Supper. Kind of like a potluck dinner like we do here. Okay. So, um, three, okay. one is hungry, another is drunk. Uh, what do you do that you have houses to eat and drink? Um, or do you despise the church of God that you've seen those who have nothing? See, the whole context is within the church. Um, I remember one Sunday I was in Arizona for business years ago, and I visited a little Covenanter church, if you know who the Covenanters are, Reformed Presbyterian Church in North America. They had a lunch together. Everybody brought the sack lunches. And this one family said, sure, come on, join us. And they just shared their lunch with me. See, what these people were doing when they had the dinner together, some people call them agape feast, you've heard that was they weren't doing that, okay? So one guy's there eat, you know, eating a steak and the other guy has got a hot dog because that's all he can afford. Another guy can't even afford that and they're not sharing among themselves, okay? So the, the point here is they were missing the point of, what do we call the Lord's Supper? Communion. They were missing the whole point of communion, which is sharing. Okay. Do you despise the church and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not praise you. And then Paul proceeds to talk about the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one, Ephesians 4. And we're going to, um, just to help us understand, we're going to go back to the eighth grade. Have you all finished eighth grade? We got two months left, Steve. Okay. okay. <laughs> So I'm sure eighth grade is where I learned to diagram sentences. Is that when you learned to diagram sentences was eighth grade? Okay, I still remember that. Okay, you, when they taught you to diagram sentences, you had no idea that that was going to be a major tool in exegesis in the scripture. And it is. Okay, and we're going to see that here. Beginning in verse 11. He himself, that's Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to a unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, you may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ. It's a long sentence, isn't it? Okay. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by which every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body. So here's my point. We have a sentence there at the end, right? We have a subject and a verb, if I remember right, okay? The verb is causes the growth of the body, 
right? We have a prepositional phrase here of the body, so which is used as the object of the verb, causes the growth, okay? What is the subject of the verb? Who causes the growth? Don't answer it without looking. Don't say, well, it's God. Because when you look at the text, God is using somebody. Who? It's not that difficult. Well completed eighth grade. You told me that, right? Okay. Verse 16, from whom the whole body, then there's a bunch of stuff in between that's adjectival, causes the growth of the body. So who causes the growth of the body? The whole body. And actually, probably we should just say the body. And it's got two adjectives, the and another one, whole. Right? Okay. So the body causes the growth of the body. Now, there are people that are against this. Okay. Uh, John's going to preach for a minute. Yes. I'm serious. You are not to teach each other the Bible. This is what they say. And you are not to open your Bibles and talk with them. Your job, and this is a quote, your job is only to bring people to church. And let the pastor do it in the sermon. That's it. What does this say? Causes the growth of the body. Who causes the growth of the body? The body causes the growth of the body. And who is the body? The church. We are the body. Okay. It, it, do you see this, by the way? Not this, but do you see when people have that attitude that that's a remnant of three office view? They're three office people. Why? What is the three office saying? We're the ministers. We are the clergy. We are the professionals. And we are the ones that do the job. Right? Okay. You see, that's where I think part of it comes from. So the church causes the growth of the body. Finally, the responsibility of elders requires church membership. Hebrews 13, 17. 13, 17. <coughs> repeat the question. Oh, I didn't get my repeat the question sign out, did I, Peggy? <laughs> it's right here. Peggy. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Hebrews 13, 17. <laughs> okay, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, that they would be unprofitable to you. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Now. The concept of rule over you assumes that there's some sort of leadership. It assumes that you have voluntarily said, I will submit to the leadership of this person. And when you do that, you have an organization, don't you? Okay. When you have leaders and members or followers, you have an organization. And that organization is called the church. So my point is you put all these together and you have the concept of membership in the church. Yes, Harlan. Uh, the Revised Standard Version says obey your leaders and submit to them. So they, they specifically says leadership. Yeah, they're specific. So the, R, the, the repeat the question. Har Harlan was saying that in the RSV it actually translates it leaders. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Okay. My point is when you see this, you see the issue of, uh, yes, it assumes on all of these, when you put them together, there's an assumption that there's some sort of organization and there are leaders in the organization, there are members of the organization, and that you are part of an organization. Any questions on that? Yes, Phil. Well, just a clarification, uh, maybe a technical point, but the responsibility of the sheep to obey their leaders, is that uh, meant to be applied Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Phil's question was, the idea of obeying, whom do you obey? Is it an individual or is it the session as a group when the session is speaking officially as, a, as, as the session? 
in contrast to an individual elder. You guys all have answers to that? Yeah. Typically, yeah, it's that. It's the organization of the session. Um, simply because um, elders are elders as part of the session. Okay. Um, now, believers ha have some sort of responsibility to each other. And when, when um, Elder Steve comes and talks to me, you know, is Steve talking to me or is it Elder Steve who's talking to me? And the answer is it's both, really, okay? And when Steve is talking to me, he's talking to me as Steve and also as an elder. And so I listen to him and I have that deference to him, but the official activity is the activity of the session. Not, now, a, the session may send one person, but he's representing the session. Mm -hmm. I'm obligated to obey, but I be within my reasonable situation that I can say I would like to know what the session Sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, where is this coming from? Tell me why. And, and what the elder ought to do is, uh, yeah, repeat the question. The question is, if an elder comes to Phil and says, you should do this, is it legitimate for Phil to say why? Where is this coming from? Things like that. Yeah. Did you want to amplify that, Elder Steve? I was going to say he has the right to go to the session and complain. Sure. Yeah. Compl remember, com <laughs> <laughs> remember that complain is not a meaning gripe. It's a technical term to you bring a document saying an administrative mistake has been made. Right. Yeah. 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 Repeat that. <laughs> Kent was saying that as an example, he used to have a, um, not just a prayer before class, but receiving prayer requests and group praying together, etc. And Kent realized that's taking a lot of time away from the class time, so he decided to stop doing that. An elder came and talked to you and said, you know, I really miss that. And Kent's point, well, is that the session talking to me or is that you talking to me? Okay. So, yes, Steve. In this Mm -hmm. outreach and uh, worship and Sunday school. And so those individuals have a responsibility to make sure those, the flow of those things happen. So they may, as an individual, ask for certain things, but mm -hmm. they're always going to be, generally speaking, they're always going to be brought up to the session, except for some of the like fine-tuned details, like how things read on the internet or anything like that, or, or some of the things, that might not be brought up. But the majority of every, all the facilitating, all the stuff that goes on here, the individual is uh, planning, doing things, getting people involved, asking people to teach, this, that, and the other. Uh, um, so yeah. there is some individual um, facilitation. Steve's point was, within the session, they have divided their responsibilities Within subgroups, the point is for efficiency, and sometimes there's some authority within that. But you always have the right to appeal to the session. Right.
Yeah. Phil's point was Phil is going to be teaching a class that started in a few weeks and it was Phil's been working with a particular elder whose job is ta his, he's tasked with the educational part Chris yeah. okay let's move on to the to um, the next topic and that is the government of the state and the government of the church we've talked a little bit about this I'm, I want to go through quickly because we do have a carryover item from last week also the relationship between the civil government and the church government. Now this is becoming a touchier and touchier and a more important and more important issue in our society because, uh, and I'm gonna get political, so get your steel toe shoes on, the civil government is voracious and demanding in its desire to control everything. And that's where the civil government is headed. Okay, and they want to control everything, and by everything they mean everything. They want to know what you spend your money on, they want to know what you goes on in your church, and where you meet, and may you meet, and they'll be glad to tell you you may not meet. And the argument is, and there is an interesting article that came out, Christ not Caesar is the head of the church, it just came out, talking about the issues at Grace Community Church in the Los Angeles area where the, the uh, city government and the state government told them you may not worship, and they said, we will worship. And uh, Grace Community Church took them to court and Grace Community Church won. And the interesting thing is they had 11 different trial or groups before, before one judge. The judge was a homosexual who had his male partner or husband or whatever, but the judge said, the Constitution says this, and you can't get beyond the First Amendment to the Constitution. And the judge put the city and the state of California in their place. Praise God that there was a judge like that. Okay. But even if the judge had ruled the opposite, we have to ask ourselves the question, who is the head of the church? And it's Jesus Christ and him alone. And I'm exhorting you that this, these issues are going to come, and they're going to come more and more and more. So let's go on. What is the relationship between the civil government and the ecclesiastical government? Is there an ecclesiastical government? Well, let me ask you, what have we been talking about for 12 weeks? <laughs> ecclesiastical government, right? So there is a church government, okay? And we've defined Caesar or Papism and Erastianism. Okay, who's going to define those for me again? Caesar or Papism? The church and the civil government are one like in Islam, so Caesar and Pope, like the Pope, the Father, okay, Caesar or Papism. And what's Erastianism? Notice the uppercase E, because it's named after somebody named Erastus, okay? He was around the time of the reformers, 1500s, 1600s. What's Erastianism? Right, the civil government has authority over this church, like in England, wherever there's a state church, England, the, the uh, Scandinavian countries, places like Germany, have a state church. So who's the head of the Church of England? The Queen is. And she'll be glad to appoint whichever bishop she wants to appoint. Hmm. Now I want, to, you see we have some notes here about the, the uh, governments are distinct. The nature of Christ's kingdom. What does Jesus say to, to uh, Pontius Pilate? Are you a king? Pilate says, and he says, yes, but my kingdom is not of this world. Okay. If it were of this world, my disciples would revolt. But they don't revolt because we're in the kingdom of Christ. Now, we have no problems understanding those differences and living within the tensions, typically. Okay. Uh, Matthew 22, 15, and there's a typo. It's not 15 through 17. It's 15 through 22. So we turn to Matthew 22. So the Pharisees were plotting uh, um, and they sent to his disciples with the Herodians. Who were the Herodians? They're not a religious group, they were a civil group, civil government group, followed Herod. Okay. Teacher, 
We know that you are true and teach the way of God and truth. And you do not care about anyone for you do not regard the person of men. Who knows how they're buttering them up? You know, just making them feel good and zing, in comes in. Therefore, what do you think is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus says, well, you hypocrites. Show me your tax money. So they bring a denarius. Remember, denarius was a coin, one, uh, one day's labor. Whose image is this? And they say, Caesar's. And Jesus says, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. They are separate kingdoms. And notice Jesus isn't saying Caesar is over God or the kingdom of God. But they are separate kingdoms and you're to be respectful in both of them. Okay. Matthew 16, so go back a few pages. Verses 13 to 20. Jesus is up in Caesarea Philippi. Where is Caesarea Philippi? Way north. Picture in your map the Sea of Galilee, way north of the Sea of Galilee. Caesarea Philippi. What? Yeah, way up there, way up there. Okay? So he says, disciples, who do men say that I am? Now, I have been to Caesarea Philippi, and it's an area where there was pagan worship, and they have little alcoves, and they still see them today, carved in the side of the mountain, and they would have little statues of lots of different gods. So Jesus is in this environment where it was a center for pagan worship, pagan polytheistic worship. Who do men say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, Jeremiah. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In the center for polytheism, you are the son of the living God. A monotheistic, really ultimately Trinitarian statement. Okay. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. That just means son of Jonah. For flesh and blood, I have not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. And they also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And they, he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, this is a much debated passage in the history of the church. You all know that. And it's really not that difficult a passage. Just a little side note. Most theology is not difficult. Now, we theologians want to make it so we think it's difficult, so we use polysyllabic words like Caesar Ropapism. Okay? We use that kind of language because it's the club talk. Okay? It's one of my professors talked about once. The club talk. Okay? We have to do that. Okay? But what do we see here? You are Peter, and on this rock, there's a pun there, of course, we know that. Peter is Greek for rock. And what is the rock? Well, Peter has just confessed, so it's Peter's confession that you are the confessor as the representative, the leader of the apostles. Whom does he ask? He asks the disciples, the apostles. One man answers as the representative of them, okay, and I will build my church. Now, what do you build buildings on? Foundations. And according to Ephesians, who, what is the foundation of the church? Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone with the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And here you see the apostles functioning as the foundation of the church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, typically we think of this as Hell is attacking the church and hell will not win. That's wrong. What were gates used for back then? They were defensive, right? Where's my mark? You had a city, you know, here's a city, and it had a gate right here, right? And so the gate would swing open, or maybe swing in, typically more, okay? You shut the gate. What is the purpose of the gate, among other things? Is to allow people in, but to keep people out. It's a defensive mechanism. So if the gates are not going to work, if the gates are going to fail, what does that mean? That means the attacking army is going to get into the city. And the city is hell. 
and the gates of hell are not going to win the battle. So we, the church, are attacking hell. And how do we attack hell? We preach the gospel, right? The gates of hell are not going to win. Finally, the New Testament teaches the church has its own government. Any questions on that point before we go to the next one? No? Okay, now, Steve, I need some help. Why don't you get somebody to help you? Thank you. There we go. Thank you, John. Okay, at the end of class, or near the end of class last week, um, I was asked, when does a church become a non-church? Um, let's put it this way, when does a church become a club? Okay. Now, this is a particularly sensitive point to me, simply because the scriptures use the word church in a very specific way. It is the body of Christ. And so if you have a group that is no longer a church, I don't think they should be called a church. Okay, okay, I'm going to get specific. The Roman Catholic Church should not be called a church. It is not a church. Strong language. There are lots of organizations out there that are called churches, but they are not. Years ago, when we had the Yellow Pages, some of you people my age remember the Yellow Pages, okay? And you would look at businesses, and you look at churches, and lo and behold, the list of churches would be the local Buddhist group, and the local this group, and that group, none of which were Christian, even in, a, in name, but they were under church. Okay, so let's look at the question, when does the church become a non-church? And um, another way to, to, to look at this is to say, what are the historic signs of a true church. Now, the answer here is the historic answer, and I want to put it up and then challenge the answer just a little bit. It's a really good and helpful answer, but let's look at it. Okay, so the signs of the true church are the, the faithful preaching of the word, proper administration of the sacraments, S -A -C, sacraments and faithful discipline. of its members. That's the historic sign definition, or the historic criteria. What is a true church? It's got to have proper preaching, it's got to have a proper administration of the sacraments and the proper discipline of its members. Now, uh, in the last, oh, 20 years or so, the issue of church discipline is becoming more and more important. You mean you actually discipline your members? You don't discipline your members? Okay. There are some groups that are even talking about, yeah, we discipline our members. You know, like, that's a good thing, and it should be. Now, the question is, where do these come from? Now, that's an interesting question. Um, let's look at this. What are the offices of Christ? Prophet. Prophet. Now, the church is called the body of Christ. And it's proper to say, one way the world sees Christ is they look at us. How do we function as individuals and as the organization? And you look at how these tie together. The prophetic office in the church is the preaching of the word. And in a sense, while not becoming sacerdotalists, you know what sacerdotalism is, right? where the Lord's Supper is the actual sacrificing of the body of Christ. We're not sacerdotalists. Some people call it sacerdotalists, but either way, sacerdotalists, okay? But it's a priestly activity in a sense. And surely disciplining, encouraging our members, leading our members, you know, is the kingly activity of Christ. So I think that's the historical background of the, of the terminology. Now, I, I have in there a couple of notes in there that maybe we should add a couple more to these signs of the true church. And, and notice this. These are things that the leaders do. Right? The leaders do the preaching of the word. The leaders administer the sacrament. The leaders do the discipline in the church when you get to formal discipline. 
right? And the question is, yes, but that's the leaders, but what about the everyday people? What about the everyday people? How are they a true church? And how do they function as a true church? So while I think this is a good definition or a good set of criteria, um, perhaps it needs a little bit of fine tuning. Okay, and notice I got a couple other suggestions here. The church is a body, of, I'm sorry, can we add one or two more? How about loving one another? What does Jesus say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Isn't Jesus saying that that's a sign of the church, loving one another? There's a statement made by a man named Tertullian. Who was Tertullian? Tertullian was a Christian leader uh, and an apologist, those who would deal with non-believers, back in the 200s. And Tertullian, one of his arguments why, why Christianity was true, he said, look at what the pagans say about us. Behold how they love one another. How we take care of one another. How we're concerned about one another. And we do it literally, we do it financially, we do it by encouraging people, all kinds of ways that we love one another. So perhaps that's a sign too that we would want to put up here. And you see how that involves the people more than just the leadership? Okay. And how about this? I just read this last night. Somebody saying, the willingness to suffer for Christ. If we're not willing to suffer for Christ, maybe we're not a true church, in other words. And if, things, if persecution becomes worse, maybe that's a sign too. Okay. Yes, Missy. Very good. So being, you're saying being light reflects all of these. Sure. Yeah. And it's interesting. John uses that language as Jesus is the light of the world, but also we're called the light of the world. Yes. We're the city set on the side of the hill that cannot be hidden. Right? Yes. So we reflect Christ. Which is another way of saying it. this is a reflecting Christ to the world. Good point. Thank you, Missy. Yeah. Very good. What about salt of the earth? What does that mean? Isn't it interesting? Jesus never defines what it means. The assumption seems to be, well, you're supposed to know what salt does. Right? And people talk about salt as a preservative, right? But it's more than that. It's also a flavor enhancer. Okay, it makes life a little better. It preserves society. I remember talking with a guy in a Bible study a few years ago up in Virginia, and he said, society's falling apart. Well, that was true, and it is now. He said, we're supposed, to be, we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're not doing a very good job. Yeah, and I think he was right. So, yeah. Okay. Which is part of ministering to the church, of the society. <coughs> okay. Now, if we go back to those three, Faithful preaching of the word, proper administration of the sacraments, and proper discipline, okay? We look at these. Let's do some quick church history in our mind. Of these three, which is the one that goes the first, chronologically? The discipline does, right? The discipline does. We don't discipline our members. And if we don't discipline our members, after a while, these others are gone. Okay? Yeah, Mark. Wouldn't it be preaching that goes first? Because if you're properly <clears throat> preaching, you would know that you're supposed to be disciplined, right? Yeah, when you're, so you're saying discipline is really an application of Scripture. So therefore, we're not applying Scripture properly. And is that, is that a subcategory of preaching? Living and, pre and teaching and living God's Word. So we're not living it, right? Okay, uh, I think it, that's what happens, but it happens particularly in this area. So I wanna focus beyond this. So I think you're right, but I wanna focus and be a little more pointed in our thought. Okay. Yes? Sure. 
In other words, people who, who doubt or deny in inerrancy, that usually shows up in preaching. But let me ask you, what happens to the guy who denies inerrancy? Nothing. Found a discipline. Now, let me pick on the OPC, because that's my background, okay? You all know that. Well, you all know I'm from Southern California. The Presbytery of Southern California, oh, maybe this was 10 years ago, okay, had a minister who on his own website, and this will date the situation, said, the state of California should recognize homosexual marriages. That was an OPC minister who said that in writing. Okay. Now, why did he say that? Two kingdom. He believed in inerrancy of scripture and all that, but the scriptures have nothing to say about political issues. That was his perspective. Okay. And so therefore you just ask the question and this is the way he put it. How do we get along with these unbelievers better? Well, we're nice to them. And he said this, hopefully they'll be nice to us. I'm not exaggerating. Well, he was disciplined by the presbytery finally, and he was not put out of the ministry, but he was, was um, exhorted, okay? Admonished is the technical term. Okay, he was admonished, okay? And the res end result of that was he left the OPC and went to the PCA and was welcomed with open arms, okay? The issue is not done. Because today, in the Presbyterian of Southern California, it is common to have, uh, and I want to say, maybe it's the dominant perspective. Remember, that's where I'm from. This two kingdom stuff where scripture is irrelevant to politics. Okay. So was he disciplined? Yes, in a minor way. But what about all the other guys that agreed with him? What about the faculty members at Westminster Seminary in Escondido that are teaching that stuff? Because that's where it came from. Okay. I know. I founded Westminster Seminary Escondido. There were four OP ministers. I was one of them. My dad was on the board for years. But the seminary has changed. Okay. Where this two kingdom stuff now reigns in Escondido. And are they being disciplined? The answer is, no, they're not being disciplined. They are in the majority. And that's what's going on. Now, am I saying the OPC is not a true church? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you as a historic example, that's what goes first. Let me give you another example from history. In the 1920s and 1930s, that's, you know, 90, 100 years ago, in the United Presbyterian Church with Machen and all of his controversies, if you know a little bit about that, why is it that Machen never filed charges against the heretics? And they were heretics. They were denying Christ's substitutionary atonement. They were denying inerrancy. They were denying the virgin birth. They were denying the physical resurrection. Why were they never disciplined? I don't know. I've asked the experts in the church history issues. I asked them that personally. Why were they never tried? And his answer was, I don't know. Yeah, Mark. So if you say that the OPC, at least in some areas, is lacking in discipline, why then are they not a true church? No, why then are they a true church? And why aren't you saying they are? Uh, I, th I think because when you look at these, okay, the question is, why would you say the OPC still is a true church? That's your question, Mark. I think because you look at, you look at trends, you don't look at a one-time you know, one event, and you don't look at a little piece of it. Okay, there are many people in the OPC that are not two kingdom people. Me, okay? But it's becoming a minority position, okay? The OPC has not denied the gospel. There's no, there's no, there's no, no, way that, there's no hint of that in the OPC of denying the gospel. No hint of that to, at all. So, so they still are holding this, but they're getting weak on disciplining their members. Okay? Now, this is going to be on the internet, and some OPC minister is going to find it, and I'm going to get tried. I don't know. Maybe so. We'll see. Could you clarify what you mean by two kingdom? 
Yeah, what is two kingdom? Thank you. Two kingdom thought says that God has two kingdoms. One kingdom is the church, the other kingdom is everything else. The Bible relates to, influences, controls the church, but the Bible has nothing to do about the other stuff. And where do you get God's rules on the other stuff? This is their language, natural theology. Okay. Now I wanna ask you a question, where do I get the book of natural theology so I can go read it and study that theology? Seriously, there is no book of natural theology. Here's a book of theology right here, right? Two kingdoms. You have natural theology, and that's what controls that. May I give you a real life example? A man was coming in from the Presbyterian of Southern California to the Presbyterian of the Mid-Atlantic. I was there. I knew the guy, because I used to be chairman of the committee that examined all this. So I knew the guy personally. Really a nice young man, very respectful, wanted, wanted to be, uh, preach the gospel, love the church. So I asked him a question. I said, because uh, we're in the Washington, D.C. area, I said, you're moving into the Washington, D.C. area. And I was surprised when I, when I now live here, I see how much influence Washington, D.C. has on just society in general in this area geographically. So I said, given that, how does your theology affect your politics? And his answer was, well, theology is in the area of, of the new creation. Remember Paul says that we're a new creation? And politics is in the area of the old creation. They don't relate. Is that a good example? Now, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm one of these guys that always has a great answer the next day. Okay. <laughs> you like that too? Okay. Second Corinthians chapter, is it five? You know, behold, we are a new creation. What is the next sentence? All things have become new. It isn't some things are new creation and some things are old. All things are new creation. But anyway, I thought of that later on. But my point is there's an example. So you see that? One of my questions I want to ask people is, how does your theology affect your, your economics? No, nope, can't do that. Old creation, new creation. I haven't asked that question, but I want to ask that. But you, you see the point there then? Okay, so that generates another question. Sure, go ahead, Andrea. Uh, are you saying that, or, or is this another way of saying, my relationship with Jesus Christ impacts every part of Yes. No, I'm saying theology drives your relationship. Theology is your, your intellectual understanding that drives how you think and how you behave. Okay. Why am I nice to you? Because Christ tells me to be nice to you, right? Why are you nice to me? Because Christ tells you to be nice to me, right? Because we're one in Christ, okay? We're sinners who have been saved by the same methodology. Christ's death and resurrection for us. There's theology. Is it two sides of the same coin? Nope. The, okay. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I cut you off. I apologize. Yeah. Yes. So that, Yes, it is the same thing. Okay, there's my wife. Okay, the question is, are the two sides of the same point? Okay, do, am I nice to my wife because I love her, or am I nice to my wife because Christ says love your wife? Both. They're not contradictory. They're not exclusive. They, there are two reasons to drive me to be nice to my wife. Okay, so that, that helps clarify. Okay. So, so two kingdom theology separate. By the way, it's, uh, they want to say it's historic reform. I'll get to you. Look at chapter one, paragraph six of the Westminster Confession. All things for doctrine in life are either stated in scripture or can be deduced by good and necessary consequences from scripture. All things in life. Okay. So our politics, you know, our job, how I treat my boss, how my boss treats me, all of that's theology. Everything is theology. So when Ligonier says we're all theologians, they're exactly right. We are all theologians. Yeah. Could you, um, we still got a couple more minutes. Could you elaborate on the statement you made why uh, the Roman Church is not 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. But, uh, yeah, back to sign of a true church. Okay, Steve's question, why is the Roman church not a true church? Okay. Proper preaching of the word, proper view of the sacraments, and proper discipline. Which of these does the Roman church do? Do they discipline people? No. Do they have proper view of the sacraments? No, they teach that you get grace by doing the sacraments, right? You are saved because you take the Lord's Supper, etc. You get, you get forgiveness because you take the Lord's Supper, etc. Do they preach the word properly? No. So which of these signs does the Roman church have? None of them. The Roman church is not a church. Does that answer your question? Okay. Now, go ahead, Mark, another question. I think, okay, the, the question is, how tight are we going to be on the issue of sacraments? If somebody disagrees with us, in other words, they believe, the theological term is credo-baptism. Credo means I believe. They have to say I believe, and then you are baptized in contrast to pedo-baptism, which is infant baptism, okay? So therefore, they're not a true church. I think the answer is no, because the gospel drives those. Those people that believe in credo-baptism believe the gospel. Okay? And they do not look at baptism as a way to be saved, except for some small groups like Church of Christ. Again, I think Church of Christ because they blow the, the gospel, therefore they blow the doctrine of baptism. So they're not a church, okay? Even though they have the word church in their name. I'm just stepping on toes, aren't I? Okay? So the, the point here is, is the gospel drives all of these. So. Our Reformed Baptist brothers and sisters, I use the term brothers and sisters intentionally because they are brothers and sisters in Christ and they are a church. They do not think that baptism saves. So, are you saying, I'm just trying to understand this, are you saying as long as they believe the gospel and they don't believe that the sacrament saves you, that the sacrament box is checked? Pretty much, yeah. Repeat it. Mark asked me, if a group preaches the gospel and believes the gospel and they say sacraments don't save you, does that sacrament box get checked? The answer is yes. Okay, it's time. One last thought, okay? I, you may have questions, come on up afterwards, but in a minute. Do you remember, this is a cor cor course on church government. So let's go back in your notes, page 10. Okay, remember this, the six ideas of church government? Office bearers are chosen by the people. Bishop equals elder equals pastor. Steve always calls me Pastor Garrisey. Is that legitimate? Yes. Can we call him Pastor Steve? Yes. Confusing to society, right? Right, Pastor? <laughs> Over there? Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Biblically, that's correct. <laughs> okay. Plurality of elders in every church. Okay. Ordination is the act of the plurality of the elders. The right to appeal to the broader church. The whole idea of appellate levels at the church. And Christ alone is the head of the church. Yes. Now, we saw that only Presbyterians check all the boxes, right? Okay. Brother Kent came to me afterwards and said, he knows Reformed Baptist people that check five of those boxes. We need to remember that, okay? They're, they're not true congregationalists at all. They have elders in their church, and the elders are their leaders and their governors. They have that squared away. The only thing they don't have is the idea of appealing to the broad of the church. We need to understand that, okay? Good, well, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given to us government in your church. And we pray, our Father, that our, our leaders would help us in Christ and we would be respectful to our leaders as they shepherd us in Christ. And we pray, Father, that we would go out here 
glorifying you for what you've given to us. And we thank you, Father, for our leaders. And we thank you that you have given us a system of government in your church. We pray, Father, that that system would spread and spread and spread as churches then become more and more obedient to what your word teaches. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son,